Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to this Wednesday uh, webinar. Uh, if you haven't watched one of these before, uh, just something at Burkitt Long we put on every fortnight um, on a range of different subjects. Um, as you'll see uh, from the presentation in front of you, this one is on wills, uh, as you'll know already, and why everyone needs one, even if you're under 25. Uh, now we've got about half an hour um, worth of presentation now. As we go through, there'll be some questions um, that I can take at the end. But the main focus today really um, is just to discuss wills, why it's really important that you have one in place. Uh, and it's to give you a bit of food for thought really. So if you're listening to this um, and you don't have the will in place already, um, or perhaps if you do have a will, um, but you prepared it a number of years ago and perhaps it needs a bit of updating, it's just to give you some thought as to go away, have a think about those sorts of things and perhaps look at getting something uh, in place. Uh, it's amazing, actually, I double checked before uh, coming on to this webinar uh, and Canada Life, um, one of the financial institutions, um, prepared some research uh, last year in 2020. And they found that three in five adults don't have a will in place. So it's quite frightening the amount of people that don't have these sorts of things in place. Uh, and hopefully it's my job today to tell you why you know, these, these wills are needed. So if we could go over to the next slide, please. So as you'll see there, it's just something I need to, to go over with you. Although the law surrounding wills and, and, and probate um, is, is not particularly fast moving. Um, of course, there could be some changes in the future. Um, so the information that I'm going to provide today in this presentation is just for general purposes only. Um, it doesn't constitute legal advice. And of course, it's all correct uh, as of today. Um, something in particular, as we go through, we do just touch on um, inheritance tax and the different thresholds uh, for when an estate may be uh, liable to inheritance tax. So again, that's just one key thing that I'll say has got the potential to change um, in the coming years, but everything over today is correct. So if we pop onto the next slide, please. And I'll just talk you through the agenda for today. As I say, we've got about 30 minutes or so and some time afterwards for uh, some questions. Um, but I'm first and foremost going to tell you a little bit about myself. We'll then touch base on the intestacy rules which explains what happens if you don't have a will in place when you pass away. Uh, we'll then talk about the process of actually preparing a will. We'll then touch on inheritance tax, as I said just a moment ago. As I say, we'll then have questions. If anybody has any questions at all, big or small, please do feel free to raise them at the end um, because sometimes that can uh, really help others um, as well. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. So a little bit about myself. So you'll see me there. Um, my name is David Feekins. Um, I'm a solicitor in the Wills Trust and Probate team over in Colchester. Uh, you may well know we also have offices that cover Wills Trust and Probate in Chelmsford and Basildon as well. Uh, but my day to day job um, is drafting wills, um, dealing with the administration of states, so obtaining grants of probate. Uh, and also preparing lasting powers of attorney. Now, we don't really touch on lasting powers of attorney uh, in this webinar as our main focus is going to be on wills. But just as a side note, um, it's worthwhile me just taking a minute out just to give you a little bit of information about powers of attorney as majority of people don't actually realise what a power of attorney is. Um, all of us know what a will is and what a will does. Um, whether or not we have a will in place is a different question, but many people don't realise what a power of attorney is. Now, a power of attorney um, is for during your lifetime, so a will only kicks in when you pass away, but your power of attorney will be able to deal with your financial affairs or your health and welfare if something happens to you during your lifetime, i.e. you lose capacity. When you pass away, it becomes null and void and your will then kicks in. But it's also certainly something you should have a think about at this stage, um, a lot of people leave it, unfortunately, until it's too late to do a power of attorney. So I get a lot of calls from husbands, wives, children uh, calling me up and saying, David, you know, you prepared the will. Um, is there any chance you can come and see us to prepare a lasting power of attorney as mum or dad? They've just had a stroke um, and we need to get something in place. And if the person doesn't really understand, you know, and has lost capacity at that point and doesn't understand what they're signing, 
then it can lead to a really tricky conversation because I, as a solicitor, I have to say, well, you know, I can't actually go and see them sign because if they're not understanding what they're signing, um, then it's too late. So as I say, just a side point for now, if you have any questions about powers of attorney, along with wills, later on, you'll have all my contact details and please do feel free to give me a call or, or to email me on any questions you may have. But for now, we'll, 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 we'll trot on with wills. So if we can have the next slide, please. So this flowchart you'll see in front of you here um, explains the intestacy rule. So when somebody dies without having made a will, they die what's called intestate. And you'll see from this flowchart where your estate would, would, would go to on your death. So the really important thing to note here is that if you're unmarried, so if you're engaged, if you just have a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever the case may be, any significant other, if you're not married or you're not in a registered civil partnership, that person is not going to be entitled to any of your estate. And, and you know, a lot of people mistakenly think that there's uh, you know, common law husband and wife. If you're living together as husband and wife, then you know, your significant other will um, receive everything. And unfortunately, that isn't the case. So if you fall within that category of people where you're not married or not in a civil partnership, but you want to make sure that your significant other is you know, looked after when you pass away, then you really have to think about getting the will in place. However, let's say, for example, you are married. Uh, so you'll see the flow chart stems to the left there uh, if you are married. And then it asks, do you have any children living? Um, if the answer is no, then everything will go to your spouse under the intestacy rules. If you do have children, then it can become a little bit more tricky. Um, what a lot of people mistakenly think is that when they die, absolutely everything is going to go to their husband and wife, whatever the case may be. So why do they need a will in place? Well, you'll see from the flow chart there that if you have children, technically speaking, not everything is going to go to your children, uh, sorry, to your spouse. The first £270,000 is going to go to your spouse, but anything over and above £270,000 is going to be split between your children and your spouse. So technically speaking, the children will get something if your estate is over 270,000. Now, your estate may be under that. And if it is, then fine, it will still all go to your spouse. However, if you do have an estate that goes over and above that, if you've got a lot of cash and bank accounts, if you have um, a property that's held in tenants in common, so you hold a distinct share of that property, and it takes you over and above that 270,000, it could well have some tax implications um, on the second death. So again, later on, we'll go through some of the inheritance tax thresholds and, and I'll make a note of this at that point. But if not everything is going to your spouse, so if some of the money is going to your children under the intestacy rules, that could have an impact when your spouse dies. Uh, so on the second death, there could have an impact on inheritance tax and could mean you end up paying much more than expected. Uh, if you're not married or, or, or not in a registered civil partnership, you'll see the, the flow chart there stems to the right. Uh, so we first look to see whether you've got any children. If no children, then look at parents, no parents, brothers, sisters, nieces or nephews, and so on, as you'll see, grandparents, aunts, uncles and, or cousins, or if there's absolutely nobody surviving there, um, then the Crown takes everything. Now, it's very, very rare that the Crown will take everything. Um, but I have had the situation before. A couple of years ago, I was dealing with a probate. The lady that died was 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 in her 80s. She had no children. Um, so we had to, to, to look down, um, you know, no spouse as well. So we had to look down this flow chart to the right here. Of course, she was in her 80s, so her, her parents had died. She did have a brother. Um, the brother had no children and he had predeceased her. So we didn't have anything there. Of course, no grandparents for obvious reasons. What we did have those, we did have surviving cousins um, and we had to prepare a huge genealogy report at the time. We had to instruct somebody um, to prepare a huge family tree for us. Um, and actually, the, the beneficiaries were located here, there and everywhere. We only had one in the UK. Uh, the majority were in the US. Um, we had some in Canada, some in New Zealand, um, you know, absolutely everywhere. And of course, we were writing to those beneficiaries um, at really an expense to the estate. Um, to say that they were due X amount under the, the estate of the lady that had passed away. Um, most of them thought it was a scam at first, you know, having somebody write to them saying, we're going to be paying you £20,000. What are your bank account uh, details, please? Um, but, you know, in the end, we, we, we got there. Once everyone had seen the family tree um, and they knew they were cousins, 
um, of this lady that passed away, then we were able to deal with the administration. But I always think back to that and think that, you know, that lady we were dealing with, surely she would have rather her estate have gone to somewhere where she would have wanted it to go to, whether it be, you know, a family friend, whether it even be a charity that was close to her heart, rather than her cousins that were the other side of the world um, that really she had never met, didn't even know they existed. Um, of course, they were happy, but I always think back and think, well, maybe she should have put something together during her lifetime to make sure it was going in line with her wishes. So if we could have the next slide, please. So there's certain things to think about when you're preparing a will, and I've just put down a few bullet points here as a bit of a snapshot of the sorts of things that you should be thinking about. So first and foremost is who do you want to name as executors? So your executor's job is to um, administer the will. So they pick up the will, they deal with everything, how it's set out, and make sure that your beneficiaries um, receive their inheritance. Now, if you don't have a will in place, of course, you haven't named any executors because there's nothing there to, to name anybody that you want to deal with your estate. So it goes to um, whoever is has standing is what it's called. So you follow the intestacy rules again. You see who has standing. Uh, that could be um, a parent, uh, it could be a brother, it could be a sister. Um, so again, if you have a significant other um, that isn't provided for under the intestacy rules, you then have a parent or a brother or sister that perhaps doesn't quite get on with your significant other for one reason or another. You can see where the problems start arising here because you may have somebody dealing with your estate that maybe you wouldn't particularly choose to in an ideal world. Um, you know, we see it a lot. No families are perfect. Um, you may have fallen out with mum or dad or, or brother or sister uh, over the years. So if that's the case, would you really want to run the risk of them dealing with your estate? Probably not. But again, by having a will, we can get around these sorts of things. Another thing to think about as well is do you have any young children? So this is where it plays into the to the younger generation as well. Or, you know, if you're grandparents and, and you know that your children don't have wills in place, but they have children of their own, then maybe it's something that, you know, you should be having that conversation with them to have their wills in place. Because if you have young children, of course, whilst they're still minors, they need somebody to look after them. So if the mum and dad was both to die, uh, you know, they both went out and, and, and got you know, caught in a car crash. I'm afraid talking about wills is, is quite morbid, I'm afraid, but, you know, there's, there's an example. You know, it can happen. It has happened in the past. You know, and they've got a young child of one or two years old. Well, what happens to that child? And in the will, what you can do is you can add a guardianship clause. So you can say it is my wish that if something was to happen to you know, me and my partner, you know, we want um, my parents to look after the child or we want my lifelong friend to look after the child. Um, and it's those sorts of things that you have in the will, which, again, just shows your wishes. So if anything, God forbid, was to happen to you whilst you had young children, we're just making sure that your wishes are heard and that the children go to somebody that you want them to go to. And perhaps not necessarily a member of your family or somebody else that you, you wouldn't want them to. It might be that they're located somewhere completely different and would have to change schools and uproot their lives. And you don't want that to happen. So by having that choice in there in a will, it just gets around that. The next question um, to think about, do you have any funeral requests? So again, I get it a lot when clients call me up, they'll say mum or dad's passed away um, and I have absolutely no idea whether they wanted to be cremated or um, you know, be buried. Um, excuse me just a moment because the lights have just gone out in the room, so I'm going to have to just stand up and get a bit of light back. There we go the joys of um, having the, the, the light and not moving around. Um, the So the funeral requests, so yes, you know, we, this is not something we, we talk about because again, going back to this, it's, it's all quite morbid. You know, we don't sit around with our family members on a, on a Friday evening and say, well, I really want to be cremated. You know, we talk about our week and what we want to happen at the weekend. Um, so if you do have, I say, a preference as to whether you'd want to be buried or cremated or perhaps something else, um, then, of course, by having just a short paragraph uh, to that effect in your will, it just makes sure that, again, your wishes are being followed. And if you really have a preference to be cremated rather than buried or vice versa, it means that whoever's dealing with your estate knows that and they know that that's what they should be doing. 
the next question there is where do you want the estate to pass to? So again, this all falls back to, you know, if you didn't have a will, where would the estate pass to? It would fall in line with those intestacy rules that we spoke about. Um, but, you know, especially if you have a significant other, which I keep talking about, but if you do have a significant other um, that you want to ensure is well provided for when you die, um, you need to make sure that you have a will in place. Um, if you're single um, and you don't have any children, um, again, you may want to make sure that it's going in line with your wishes. It might be that you've got a lifelong friend or you would want your cousin to inherit um, or you would want your one particular sibling to inherit and not the other. Um, again, these are all things that can be dealt with within a will rather than running the risk of it going down the intestacy rules and going to somebody that perhaps you've had a falling out with that you don't particularly want it to go to. Or as I said earlier in that example, just somebody that you don't even know, a long lost cousin. Uh, finally there, another thing that's coming up quite regularly these days is um, if you have any pets and you want to make provision for them. So um, whether you've got a dog, cat, hamster, um, you know, when you die, who, who looks after them? Um, and if you, you, know, you know somebody that would want to look after them uh, and would be able to as well, um, then you may want to put something in your will uh, to say that that person should be looking after your pet. Um, we all know as pet owners um, how much a pet can cost as well uh, with insurance, vets fees, food, etc. Um, so some people like to leave a, a cash token in their will, a legacy um, of a certain amount um, on the basis that that person um, you know, takes their pet in and, and looks after it. So all these different things to think about. If we can go on to the next slide, please. So just reiterating here why it's important for everybody to have a will, even for those who are younger, um, because a lot of people when they come and see me, um, they'll say, well, we haven't got a will in place at the moment. And like I said earlier, you know, that 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 research from Canada Life you know, it shows us that three in five people you know, don't have a will in place. And if you're sitting at home now and, and you're listening to this, you know, you're not alone. I would say 75 percent plus of my clients, you know, they, they, they're coming in for a first time. It's something they've been putting off for for a number of years. But it's important to realise that your will only crystallises, it only comes into effect um, when you die. So for perhaps the more younger generation, uh, when they come in and they say, well, do I need to do a will? Because I haven't really got anything. So why should I do a will? There's nothing to leave. Um, because it only crystallises on your death, there could be a number of years before you pass away, you know, and and what ha what you have now may be completely different um, from what you have when you pass away. So I've given a few examples there. You know, are you are you potentially going to receive an inheritance from from parents and grandparents? Um, you, know, you may come into a, a, a different kind of windfall if you if you do the lottery. Who knows? You know, you have to be in it to win it, as they say. Um, you may you may win something on the lottery and, and all of a sudden what you think you may not have much in your estate, you then have a considerable amount. So it's, it's important to, to, to remember that. Um, and again, I've reiterated this a few times, but just to just to sound it out again, is if you're unmarried, um, then your significant other um, may not receive anything from your estate. Of course, then your significant other may get something from your estate because there are ways, technical ways in which you can vary an estate when somebody passes away. So if somebody was to pass away, um, you know, without a will, um, and so you know their lifelong partner um, who they never married. Um, didn't technically receive any inheritance under the intestacy rules. Um, if every all of the beneficiaries who would inherit under the intestacy rules um, are in agreement to do so, uh, you can prepare what's called deed variation and essentially vary the intestacy so that that lifelong partner gets something. It's easier said than done in some cases. I'm sure it'd be fine in the majority of cases, um, but when there's money involved, um, you know, it happens. Arguments can happen uh, and things can go sour quite quite quickly. So again, by having the will in place, you're just ensuring that none of this, that the coulds and the what ifs do happen. You know, it's all set in stone. Uh, and also uh, an, another thing there is, is if you have children um, that um, would potentially um, inherit. Um, so if you're young yourselves and you have young children, um, who, who are still only you know, very early years, if anything was to happen to you and their father or their mother, would you necessarily want them to inherit at 18? Is 18 a bit too young? 
absolutely fine if you would want them to inherit at 18, but if you prefer them to wait a bit until they're a bit older, say 21 or, or 25, again, that's something that we can put in the will to make sure that they don't get everything at 18 um, and end up spending it very unwisely. Um, the good thing about having a age bracket within the wills as well is although we may say 21 or 25, um, it can be released early to them if it's for a good reason. So a lot of people think, well, actually, I'll quite like them to have it at 18 um, because in case they want to go to university or in case they want to put a deposit down for a house. Um, even if we were to stipulate 21 or 25, say, for example, they can still have it early if it's for a good enough reason. So if it is for university fees, if it's needed for medical purposes, if it is a house deposit and they, they've got their head screwed on, then it can be released early. But it's just something to, to think about there. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the process, the process of making a will. So it's really not daunting. Um, a lot of people you know, have this idea of when they go to uh, solicitors and they start preparing their will, it's going to take forever and a day. And when they pass away, we all see it in the films. Everybody sat round a table, all the family members and the solicitors there reading it out, saying who gets what. And it's really not like that in reality. It usually involves two meetings. Uh, we'll have an initial meeting just to go through the ins and outs of, of what you know, your estate, what's in there, who you want to leave it to. Uh, we will touch on inheritance tax and all these sorts of things. Um, and that's usually the more lengthier meeting, but it's only an hour or so on average. And then we have a second meeting when the wills are drafted and you're happy with the draft wills. We get you back in and we sign because your will will need to be signed in the presence of two witnesses. So generally I'll act as a witness and a colleague will act as a second witness. But once it's done, once it's signed, that's it. It's a big tick off the list. You don't need to worry about it again. It gets put in our vault with the thousands of other deeds and documents that we hold. And it only then ever comes out uh, if either A, you want to change it later on down the line, because we do tend to say to review your wills every five years or so. Or if you pass away, of course, then it can come out as well. And there's no charge either for storing your wills away with us and you get a copy through in the post um, just so you've got a copy there at home as well. As I say, usually done and dusted within a few weeks. We're not we're not talking months on end here uh, from the first to second meeting. It, it really doesn't take too long. Of course, it depends on the complexity uh, and whether you want to go away and have a think about certain things. But as I say, on average, usually a few weeks or so. And the last point I put in there is you'll see whilst it may be cheaper to look elsewhere or prepare, say, a DIY will, there are dangers of doing so. So I have seen wills in the past where you know, somebody will go and, and, and uh, buy a pack from WH Smith, say, for example, for 15 or 20 pounds. You've got to be so careful with the wording in wills. You know, just one wrong word um, can really upset the apple cart. Um, I've seen wills before where somebody has um, divided an estate into percentages and the percentages haven't quite added up. Um, I've seen wills where, you know, a daughter has been left the house deeds rather than the actual house itself. Uh, and it's all the wording that is just, just not quite right. Um, and if those wills were ever to be disputed for any reason, then we can run into some real problems. And usually, although you'll be paying out next to nothing for a will pack, say from WH Smith, where the costs come into it is when it's too late. So when you've passed away and all these problems are then, uh, you know, they all come to light when, when your beneficiaries go and speak to a solicitor, that's when the problems arise. And that's when it's going to cost the beneficiaries you know, hundreds, if not thousands of pounds um, to, to put these things right. So for getting it done properly through a solicitor is the best way to do it now because you're going to have that peace of mind knowing that everything is OK. Everything is going to go along with your wishes. And, and you know, there's not going to be any problems uh, once you've passed away. So if we go on to the next slide, please. So just to briefly touch on inheritance tax, like I said, I was going to. So everybody in England and Wales has an inheritance tax nil rate band of £325,000. That's what you have no matter what. However, if you have children and you have a property when you pass away, then you can leave um, your property down to direct descendants and you get an additional £175,000. So it takes your inheritance tax threshold from £325,000 to £500,000. Now you'll see the point underneath that is married couples do have the benefit that they can transfer thresholds between themselves. So if you have a husband that leaves everything to his wife and, and vice versa, um, then they will be able to claim up to one million pounds on the second death. There will never be any inheritance tax 
to pay on the first debt because it will all be called spouse exempt. So it wouldn't matter if you had £10 or, or, or £10,000, a million pounds, it would all be spouse exempt. It only would kick in when the second spouse died. Unmarried couples can't do this. So it's worth bearing in mind that if you are, you know, to a couple that, that are unmarried or, or, or you know, not in a civil partnership, and then you will only have your respective £500,000 each. Now, just going back to what I said earlier, that um, using the intestacy rules, if you have a perhaps a rather large estate um, that, you know, when the first dies, the assets in your sole name are going to be over that £270,000 mark, and therefore anything over and above that split between both your spouse and your children, this is where it can have an impact because not everything would have been left to your spouse. You may not be able to claim the full £1 million threshold. So, if you do end up with quite a large estate when you pass away, you're going to want to have the highest threshold what you can possibly have at that time, which at the moment, as I say, is a million pounds. What we don't want to be doing is we don't want to be inadvertently lowering that amount and what would be available on the second death. So again, having a will in place just stops that from happening. You'll see from the final point there that anything over and above the thresholds is charged at 40% inheritance tax. So it is quite a lot to pay as and when you get over that amount. So if you are in a situation where you have quite a lot of assets and you're quite worried and you're thinking mm, we might be there or thereabouts by the time we pass away, we do have financial advisors as well. So although I can give you advice as to the different ways in which you can mitigate tax, we have financial advisors um, with Burkitt Long IFA that can um, help with tax mitigation um, as well, because of course, the last thing that anyone wants to really be doing is, is paying a, a certain amount to the government, especially at 40%. I should just point out as well that the, if you're single um, and you have no children, um, then you can only benefit from that £325,000 limit. You won't have anything over and above that. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So yes, there's a survey to be completed. So I know we've not really gone into um, a huge amount of detail about wills. Um, if we did, we'd be here um, all night. But of course, you'll have my details in a moment. Um, and if you do, want to give me a call and discuss anything in further detail or send me an email, then then please do feel free to do so. Um, but there will be a recording um, of this that goes round to everybody that signed up um, and you can watch it at your, at your leisure. If you have any family members that you think would benefit from this as well or friends that you think would benefit from it, then please do feel free to send it on to them as well. I'm more than happy to, to speak to anybody. Uh, we're always happy to, to you know, to speak on the telephone. Don't worry, we're not going to pick up the telephone and, and start charging from the day that, you know, time you um, pick up the telephone and speak to us. That's that's another myth with with us solicitors. You know, we're more than happy to to, to talk through these things. But, you know, there's, there's, there's a survey link, as you can see there. Please do feel free to complete that survey. I really appreciate it um, if you did. Um, it's a good way of us you know, getting to grips with things and knowing what, what's beneficial for, for people in the future to listen to um, and moving forwards as well. So if we could um, go to the next slide, so you'll see that there's some upcoming um, webinars as well. So if you see anything there um, that you think will be a benefit to you, or as I say, any family members or friends, then please feel free to either sign up. Um, you'll find these on our website and you can find them on Eventbrite as well. You'll see we've got some coming up on the uh, 24th of November, 1st of December and the 15th of December. Um, so if anything there takes your fancy, then please do do feel free to sign up. So if we pass to the next slide, we'll then go on to questions. So if anybody has any questions at all, um, please feel free to raise them um, and hopefully we'll have a few to go through. Thanks, Dave. Yes, we've got quite a few. So, Okie dokie, far away. First of all, um, can an executor be a beneficiary? Yeah, absolutely. So a uh, question I get asked quite a bit is, you know, can an executor also be a beneficiary? So you know, if you have children, can they also act as your executors and be your beneficiaries? Yes, absolutely. They can be one of the same person. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with having an executor as a beneficiary. Um, even if you just have the one, it's always good to have more than one executor, we say, because if you if you only pick one, although that's absolutely fine, um, what we wouldn't want to happen is we wouldn't want something to happen to that executor and you to be left with nobody. Um, but you can, technically speaking, have one executor who's one of the same person as the beneficiary as well. So that is absolutely fine. OK, thank you. Next one is from Neil. Um, if your assets or property 
is in Scotland, is the law different? Does your solicitor need to be in Scotland? Um, so, um, yes, the laws are slightly different um, in Scotland. So our laws only cover the laws um, of England um, and Wales. Um, so there is a different process. Uh, I think it's called a grant of confirmation uh, rather than a grant of probate, which we would get over here. Um, the best thing to do in that regard, I would suggest, is speak to a um, Scottish solicitor. Um, whenever we see clients, if they have assets um, outside England and Wales, um, we, we, although we would still say prepare a will here if you have all of your assets here, um, but if you do have a property or if you have bank accounts um, elsewhere, the best thing to do is to speak to um, a professional um, in that country to see whether an English will um, would suffice. So sometimes an English will will suffice for other countries and they will accept that and they will accept an English grant of probate, um, but other countries will want um, uh, you know, a different process to be followed. So my advice there, Neil, would be um, you know, ha have a chat with a Scottish solicitor. If he says, no, I think you need to prepare a Scottish will as well, you can have two concurrent wills running together. It would just you have to be very, very careful because usually when you prepare a new will, it automatically revokes your old will. So what you wouldn't want to do if you have an English will, you wouldn't want to revoke that by preparing a separate Scottish will. Um, so you, that Scottish will would have to say, you know, it only covers my Scottish assets and it is not um, to revoke my English will. Um, but as I say, because I'm not an expert in Scottish law, I would say go and have a chat to a solicitor there and they will tell you whether or not that's something you need to do. OK, the next one is, um, can you leave a commercial building which has rental income in some sort of trust so that several beneficiaries can share the income over future years rather than having a lump sum? Yes, absolutely. So um, we haven't gone into too much detail about the types of wills you can have. So, um, you know, there, there's there's I would say your, your straightforward will where you just leave um, you know, your assets to somebody outright um, or there are wills what are called life interest trust wills um, which are quite helpful if you have children from previous relationships and you want to ring fence assets for your you know your your, your blood children um, and there's also wills called discretionary trust wills um, whereby what your will says is that rather than um, your estate being left to somebody outright uh, it can be put into a um, discretionary trust um, and whoever you name as your executors and trustees, usually one of the same, you can have different trustees to your executors and executors job is essentially to um, you know, administer the estate and get the grant to probate and ensure that all assets are collected and the liabilities are paid out. Um, if you create a trust in your will, um, your, your trustees then put their trustee hat on and have to deal with any of the assets that are held in trust. So yes, you can put a property um, into trust. So essentially you, you'll have a side letter that says how you want that asset to be dealt with by your trustees, you know, whether it be a case of keeping it within a trust and, and, and paying a, 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 you know, a, a rental to them at certain points during the year, or whether it be um, that you want to hold on to it for another 10 years or so and, and then the trustees can think about selling this and paying it out to your beneficiaries all sorts of you know ways in which you can do that um but in that respect your your advice there is is, is going to be need to be quite tailored um so the, the short answer is yes it's absolutely possible but but the, the the longer answer is you know you'd need to have a sit down with with us and and, and go through um the types of assets you know commercial property and so on that you want to put into that trust uh, because then you know, there may be um, tax issues that we need to, to have a chat about um, at the time. But, but yes, absolutely. You can put anything you want into trust rather than somebody receiving something outright when you die. Thank you. Um, next, someone would like to know what's the average cost for a solicitor to draw up a will? Yeah, so um, it, it is it is different. So um, usually what 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 we do at Burkitt Long is is it depends what type of will you need, because as I, as I just mentioned in my answer to the previous question, there are various different types of wills. You, you have your straightforward mirrored wills you know, between spouses down to children, um, and you also have um, you know, your more complex um, wills um, that 
you know, leave things to um, you know things in a discretionary trust or into a life interest trust, say for example. Um, what I tend to say is always give me a call. You'll have my details at the end. Um, a fixed fee really what we generally offer um, is a fixed fee and it has to be tailored to what you need. So what I wouldn't want to do is to give you a price um, that, that you know isn't perhaps tailored to your needs. So do give me a call um, or, or send me an email um, with my details will all be at the end of the, the um, presentation here. I'll come back to you as soon as I can and I'll let you know exactly how much um, it would be. Um, Conscious as well, of course, that things change over time. So um, if anyone was watching this um, presentation um, later on down the line, and of course it could be subject to, to change, but do do give me a call. We'll, we'll discuss your um, situation. Um, and as I say, you know, we don't we don't make any charges just for, for, for a telephone call or anything like that. You know, we don't worry about anything like that. Um, it won't be until such time as we've sat down. You've said, yep, OK, I'm happy with that, that we'll get going um, with the wills and so on. Um, Neil asks, if your company holds the will, how do you find out if someone has died? Uh, yep, yeah, good question. Um, so um, ordinarily it will be um, somebody that, that, that tells us. So um, it may be a family member, it may be um, a next door neighbour. Um, you know, we, we will generally get told that you know, Mrs Smith has, has died. We think you hold on to her will. Can you let us know? Um, now, as I said earlier, when we prepare a will, we always send through a copy and it comes in a nice pack with all of our details um, where what somebody can store safely um, back at home. We always say keep that somewhere safe and notify somebody um, where that is in worst case scenario. So if you have children or family members that you would want to um, you know, know where it is and let your executors know as well. So whoever you name as executors, tell them that you've prepared a will, you've named them as executors. And if anything was to happen, they need to go and speak to Burkitt Long. Um, because at that point then, um, we will be able to say to whomever it may be that calls us up, um, you know, so and so, you know, we, we hold on to so and so's will. Um, I have it here in front of me. As I say, they're all stored generally in our Colchester office. Um, so we have them to hand straight away. So, so in answer to your question, Neil, it's usually you know, people will come to us. There's no central system. Your details down to say that you've done a will at a certain place, but it's not uh, it's not a legal thing that you have to do. Um, so a lot of the time people call us and say, you know, do, do you know whether Mrs Smith prepared a will for you? Because we're trying to search and see whether she done one. We think she done one in the Colchester era, but we're just ringing around. Um, so if somebody, if you tell your executors, but as well, you put that copy will that you've got at home somewhere safe, fingers crossed someone will come across it um, and they will be able to, to, to you know, get in touch with us. One thing as well with that is if you've got a previous will, um, I have seen it before where um, people have a, a couple of different wills back at home. Um, you know, they've kept it somewhere safe and they've put it all in the safe um, and someone's accidentally started um, administering the state based on an old will, um, you know, not, not realising that a new will has been put in its place and it's been revoked. So my advice is always in that situation is when you have prepared a new will, if you do have an old one sitting around, just make sure you put that through the shredder or you put a big line for it saying revoked because, as I say, the last thing you want to happen is for somebody to pick that up and start dealing with your estate based on your old wishes. Thank you. Um, now, Jack asks, uh, pensions can be transferred without inheritance tax, but does the value of pensions count towards the £500,000 or million pounds? Yep, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, it's a good question. Um, so you're, you're quite right. Pensions um, usually um, fall outside the scope of your estate. So um, <clears throat> most pensions will die with you, but of course some may pay um, a lump sum on your death to um, a nominated individual, um, whether it be husband, wife, whomever. Um, some pay a continuing pension, of course, um, to a surviving spouse or to um, children, say, for example. Um, so the best thing to do in this situation is because all pensions are different, um, you're best off having a chat with your pension provider to see exactly what will happen on your death, i.e. will it die with you, will it pay out a lump sum um, or will it be a continuing pension. Um, of course, in the first instance, so if we're talking um, husband and, and, and wife scenario, say, for example, um, even if that pension 
paid out to um, say your surviving spouse, we wouldn't have to worry about any inheritance tax at that point because all of it will be spouse exempt anyway. It will only then kick in, say that say that pension pot is then paid out to a uh, HSBC account in your in your spouse's name and your spouse never touches that between now and herself dying or himself dying. Um, then, of course, whatever money is in that account is going to be um, uh, in the, within the calculations for inheritance tax purposes. So don't worry about it on the first death. It may if you're if you're unmarried or, or you're not in a civil partnership, um, then as long it's generally the case that as long as you've completed your uh, nomination requests. So usually with a pension, you'll have a nomination form. If it pays out a lump sum, where you'd want that paid to, it tend to fall outside of the state, your estate for inheritance tax purposes. Um, and also it's up to the trustees discretion of the pension as to where that's paid to. But of course, if you have a nomination form, they should be following that. Um, so long and short of it is all pensions are different. Have a chat with your pension provider, uh, see what it will pay. If it does pay out a lump sum and you're married and it's just going across to a surviving spouse, it doesn't really matter. But on the second death, if that money is still in an account somewhere, it will form part of the estate. Um, if you're unmarried um, and, and it's paying out somewhere else, then again, as long as all the forms have been completed, it shouldn't form part of your estate, so it shouldn't come into effect um, and, and it shouldn't have any um, impact upon that um, threshold, whether it be your £325,000 for a, a single person with no children or a million pounds if you're married with children. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one, still going. <laughs> um, yep. Do beneficiaries pay tax on inherited sums? Um, so good question. Um, so if you come across an estate that is liable for inheritance tax, um, as I say, anything over and above um, the threshold, um, whether that be, as I say, £325,000 for um, a single individual, um, an unmarried individual that has no children, or whether that be over the £1 million mark, um, the inheritance tax is generally paid from the estate first. So your executors will be making sure that they pay off the inheritance tax that is due. They have a certain time scale in which they can, they can do so. Um, and um, so say, for example, it's a, it's a property um, that's now empty, but the property value has, has put you over the inheritance tax threshold. Uh, generally, that will be sold um, from the sale proceeds. The inheritance tax can be paid, or it may be that there's inheritance enough inheritance tax in the bank accounts um, and everything else to um, to pay the inheritance tax that's due. Maybe some premium bonds or something like that. Anything like that can be paid um, towards inheritance tax. So the payment comes from the estate itself. Of course, it lowers the amount what the beneficiaries are then going to receive after because um, what the executors have to make sure they do is they have to make sure that they've maximised the estate. So they have to make sure that they've collected all of the assets to the best of their knowledge, information and belief, um, and they have to pay off all the liabilities. So any um, pension monies that pay back, any um, funeral costs, any administration expenses if they have legal costs um, and of course inheritance tax and then anything that's left in the pot after those payments is what's called your residuary estate and that in a will is how that's then divvied up so um, anything that's left in your residuary estate pot after all your liabilities including inheritance tax has been paid that will then be divided between whoever you named as beneficiaries i should say as well if there is a bright side to paying inheritance tax no one really likes paying inheritance tax, but it does mean that your beneficiaries will be receiving um, a considerable sum um, at the end of the day as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's nice that they'll be receiving that considerable sum rather than perhaps a lower amount um, you know, later on down the line. There are different ways as well. Again, you know, if you want to have a chat about this, please let me know um, various you know if you wanted to leave legacies to charities for example um, that will lower your inheritance tax and sorry the light's gone off again so I'm going to have to just stand up and wave myself around a bit there we go um, getting my exercise in today um, so um, yes if, if you wanted to leave money to charities whether it be a set sum 
um, or whether you wanted to leave a proportion of your estate to charities, there are ways in which you can um, lower um, your, your inheritance tax that may be due. Um, set sums that pay, pay, pay to charity are free of inheritance tax. So if you were to say, for example, I leave £10,000 to um, Battersea Dogs and Cats Home, um, then your, your estate will be lowered by that £10,000 for inheritance tax purposes. Um, additionally, if you were to leave a, a certain proportion of your estate to charity, um, then you can actually uh, minimise your inheritance tax um, payment from 40% um, to 36%, so it can help in some situations. Thanks, Dave. Um, you've used the term probate quite a few times in your talk, but could you just mm -hmm. give us a little explanation as to what that means, please? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when somebody dies, um, there's a question of whether or not um, what's called a grant of probate um, will be needed. So uh, what a grant of probate is, is um, a document um, that's issued by the probate registry that sets out who the executors are and the value of the estate as well. And as long as they're happy with everything, the will is sent off to them and they release the what's called the grant of probate. Now, a grant of probate isn't always required. Um, so, for example, if you haven't, if you come across an estate where um, the value um, of the assets is quite small, um, so if there is bank accounts, for example, that have less than £10,000, all banks have their different thresholds, but the rule of thumb is about £10,000, um, then some banks are quite happy to release the money that they hold um, just off the back of a death certificate. And of course, if you hold joint accounts, so if, you, if you're, again, um, you, know, you hold joint accounts with your significant other, if the case may be, um, then the banks will simply um, uh, take your name off the account off the back of a death certificate because it all uh, falls to the surviving um, joint owner um, through the rules of survivorship. And that's the same for a property as well. So if you hold a property as what's called joint tenants um, rather than tenants in common, um, it doesn't matter what's in your will, it automatically passes um, to the surviving owner. So you won't necessarily need a grant of probate in those situations. Uh, when you may need a grant of probate is if you have assets um, you know, in bank accounts, um, stocks and shares, or you own a property in your own name, you will need what's called a grant of probate because the grant of probate is the document uh, that gives your executors the authority um, to actually go to the banks um, and to sell the house. Um, without that grant of probate, they wouldn't be able to do anything. So what you'll find is that if, if say somebody has a bank account with a hundred thousand pounds in uh, the bank, very, very, very rarely would they release that that money without a grant of probate because they want to see um, that there's, there's named executors um, on on a, on this grant of probate, um, and and they won't they, you know, the, the money will be frozen until such time um, as your your executors do that. Um, the process is, is 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 relatively straightforward. As I say, what, what to get that grant of probate, what your executors will have to be doing um, is valuing your estate, so they would have to be given a true reflection. So they would be noting down all of your assets and um, what their worth is, um, all of your liabilities, um, whether you've made any gifts or anything like that um, over and above your annual allowance, which is £3,000 a year in the last seven years. All these sorts of things they'll be noting down and sending to the probate registry. The probate registry at the moment are taking um, quite a long time to deal with these types of applications. They, as long as I've been dealing with them, have always been working to backlogs. Um, you know, three three months or so um, to issue um, grants of probates when you make an application. Um, but in a nutshell, that's what a grant of probate is. It's it's simply a, a document that that sets out who the executors are in black and white um, and the value of the estate as well. And it is stamped and sealed by the court, um, and that will give your executors the authority to, as I say, sell a property if need to be, um, or in cash bank accounts if a bank requires um, sight of the grant of probate. That's great. Thank you. Um, regarding beneficiaries paying tax on their inheritance, is that sum included as income on their tax return or is it then tax free? Um, so it's it's tax free, so you wouldn't have to worry about any um, uh, noting any inheritance down on your personal tax returns, um, no matter what you got, you know, you could inherit £5,000, you could inherit £500,000, um, you know, that, 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 that isn't taxable on your own 
personal assets of course if you that money is then yours to do what you want so if you go and invest that five hundred thousand pounds in stocks and shares and you start receiving dividends from them then of course that would form part of your own um estate for, for, for personal tax reasons and you may have to pay your own income tax on that but for for the sake of just what you inherit no you don't pay any personal tax on it the only tax that will be um, applicable um, in the main course is, is inheritance tax. There may be um, issues with, with capital gains tax potentially. Um, so um, when somebody passes away, um, this is generally the case if you have a property or if you have stocks and shares. So if they're still in the estate, so you take the value as at the date of death. So let's say there's a house that with a value of £200,000 um, and the estate doesn't get around to selling that um, until you know, uh, six months down the line and in, in that time property prices have shot up um, and the house was actually sold for £250,000. So the estate itself has made a gain of £50,000 and that would still be liable for capital gains tax. Um, the estate will still have its own um, for two years, will still have its own um, capital gains tax allowance, which, which all of us have, £12,300. Um, anything over and above that, then we may have to pay capital gains tax, but it will still be a liability um, of the estate. There are certain ways in which you can get around that. Again, there's, there's different deeds that you can enter into if the beneficiaries aren't utilising their own capital gains tax allowance. There's ways of um, what's called appropriating property to others to minimise that tax that may be due. But no, an estate would generally only in, always only ever have inheritance tax, maybe a potential for capital gains tax if that situation occurs, but certainly not when that money's paid to you. You wouldn't have to pay any personal tax on that until that then becomes part of your, you know, your own estate and say you're investing that and, and that money's then creating dividends and income and so on and so forth. Great, thank you. Um, if we have children and both die, who would look after their inherited money until they become adults? Yeah, so another good question. So um, what happens? So if if um, you know your, your children are inheriting um, and God forbid something happens to um, both parents, um, so and the children are still very young, um, what happens is your executors will, will look after um, the, the finances. So if you have a child that's um, say uh, five years old um, and under the you know in accordance with your will you've said that they can inherit at 18 and um, then between the ages of five years old and 18 um, that money would have to be invested by um, your executors and they would look after it so it would go into some form of you know low risk um, account and then as and when your children or child reach the age of 18 they will then take that money out and have the right to take that money out along with any other income um, that they that may have accrued over that time frame. Um, that does go back again and why it's an important point to have a will, um, because if, um, say, for example, your, your estate followed the, the intestacy rules um, and your children did inherit, and perhaps the person that was in charge of dealing with your estate isn't necessarily somebody you want to be dealing with your estate, or would you also really want them to look after the money for your young children as well? So um, again, that's another reason why it's important you you, you choose your trusted um, individuals to, to act um, so they can look after that money well so that the children then aren't detrimented when they when they do reach an age when they will inherit. Thanks, Dave. That's all the questions we've had so far. That's everything. Brilliant. Um, so as the slide here shows, um, that's my contact details there, uh, email and telephone number. Um, please do feel free if there's any questions whatsoever. I understand that you know with wills it can be quite private, so you may not want to raise any questions in, in this sort of format. So um, do feel free to email me or to call me. Um, more than happy to have a chat with you on the telephone or, or via email um, about your needs and, 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 and what you may need going forwards and the costs involved and so on and so forth. Um, hopefully um, this webinar has been of use, uh, saying that we've only really touched the sides um, and, and there's a lot more that, that we could go through uh, on another day. Um, but hopefully for now it's given some good food for thought um, and, and, and yes, let's say use the survey, let us know what's good and what's bad, um, but please do get in touch if you need me. Thanks very much, I think we'll end it there.